in this video I'm going to start thinking about our our irreducible representations as vectors. And so we can have our irreducible representations act as bases for a vector here. And so the a1, a2, b1, b2 are orthogonal to each other and so they can act as bases. And so then we want to find this alpha, beta, gamma, and eta here, which essentially tell us I mean, those are components of a vector, but they also tell us sort of how many equivalent irreducible representations of that kind there are. And so these equivalence things are going to uh, start really coming up, especially in the next few videos where I start getting into much more abstract stuff like Schur's lemma and sort of finding ways of actually reducing uh, sort of reducible representations. But uh, in this one, we, I guess this video is somewhat bridging the gap between what we have been talking about and what we will be talking about. All right, and so the total degrees of freedom are three times n, where n is the number of atoms in the molecule. And so we're thinking about a molecule here, here with C to V symmetry, which uh, is water. And so that has three atoms, and so we have nine degrees of freedom. So uh, these can be represented as these nine by nine matrices, where we see the identity has ones down the entire diagonal. The 180 degree has only these two minus ones and a positive one on the diagonal. Everything else is on these off diagonals and so the trace becomes minus one. Uh, we have these two reflections where this reflection in the XZ plane uh, has uh, basically two ones for every minus one and we add that up and we end up getting three for our trace. And so then this one, we get the uh, the one for our trace on that one because uh, we just have this one, uh, minus one and one on the diagonal. And so we have this as our reducible representation. These are our irreducible representations. And so to figure out sort of what the uh, contribution uh, or a component of each of these representations are, uh, we use this formula right here. And we will actually sort of uh, derive this formula in a future video, but uh, for now we will just sort of take it for granted that this will give us each of these uh, components here. And so translated into words, we have one over the order here, where the order on the C2V is four, because we have four operations up here. Uh, so the number of operations in each class, which for this is just one per class, because each, cl each symmetry operation is its own class. Uh, so the character of the reducible representation, which are these numbers here, times the character of the irreducible representation. And so for the first one, we take, you know, the nine times the one, uh, we would, you know, times it times that one as well, plus this minus one times one times that one, and sort of sum through the entire thing. And so when we do that, we get this. And so we do that for each of these irreducible representations here. And so we get for alpha 3 for beta 1 for gamma 3 and for eta 2. So remember this was what we were trying to solve and so now we actually found those components. And so those components there actually tell us about the motions of our molecule. And so this is the C2V still right here. Uh, and so we see that we have a Z, X, and Y here, the A1, B1, and B2. And so those tell us about our translations here. Uh, and so the translational motion is the Z, X, and Y because it's just movement in the, either the Z direction, the X direction, or the Y direction. And so that is a translation. So then we subtract these three things out of our total here, and we end up with 2A1 
plus A2 plus 2B1 plus B2. We take our rotational here, which is in the the A2, the B1, and the B2. Uh, we can see that right here. And so those are our rotational uh, symmetries there, which leaves us with the 2A1 plus B1, which those will then be our vibrational modes there. And so we actually saw this in a previous video where we have the symmetric stretch, symmetric bend, and asymmetric stretch. And so only vibrational modes that have the same symmetry as X, Y, or Z are IR active. And so we see that the A1s and the B1 up here, so the A1 and the B1 do have the Z and X components there. And we can actually see that on these images here where this has that Z component there, this has that Z right there, and this has an X right there. And so those are in fact IR active. All right, so now we are actually sort of going away from the C2V, so we can kind of put a line right there, and we will be looking at the C3V group here, which is what we found these uh, representations for in a previous video. So we have these two uh, one by one representations and then this two by two representation right there. So if we associate with each representation uh, a vector, then the numbers in this represent in each of these representations are the components of that vector. And so for instance, this one up here, the totally symmetric one, we get a six dimensional vector that looks like that. For this one up here that has the three ones and then the three minus ones, we get this six dimensional vector right there. And we can actually see that they are orthogonal because if we take the dot product of the first one with the second one, we get zero, which tells us that these are orthogonal to each other. And then if we look at the two by two matrices, we can associate four 60 vectors whose components are the corresponding matrix elements. And so I've put each of the corresponding ones as the same colors. And so we can sort of distinguish these uh, six dimensional vectors by the color, which has to do with what, uh, what element of the, the four by four matrix they are. So we then also have our other two that we were talking about right here. We can see that these make up the character table. So without uh, collapsing into classes here. And so when where I have S that is uh, the square root of three over two and C is the one half here. And so we can see that adding the things up in the curly brackets will get us the the things for our E row right here. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, how those things relate to each other. And so the dimension N of a representation uh, where uh, the A and B ones are one dimensional, which we can see sort of back up here where these two are one dimensional. Then we have these two dimensional ones, which uh, is the, are these E these E irreducible representations here, we can find the order of our group like this, uh, just adding up the dimensions of each of them, which we will now call G alpha here. And so for this, it's one squared plus one squared plus two squared, which equals six. And so that is in fact, how many elements? So three, four, five, and then six right here. So that gives us the six that we have right there. And so then the length of the vectors, uh, so like I said, we've been talking about these as vectors, and we want to know what the length of these vectors are, and it is actually G over G alpha, so it would be this 6 divided by the dimension of that representation, so the two one-dimensional ones would be, would have a length of 6, and then the uh, the two-dimensional one would have a length of three because we would be dividing by two here. All right, and so in general, the orthogonality relationship says that uh, if we take the representations uh, of our groups like this and sort of add them up, then we get 
this right here. So the G over G alpha is the length of it. And then these right here are the Kronecker deltas, which are telling us essentially that, uh, so the I, J, and K, L here are sort of the matrix elements. And so only when the first ones are equal will this equal one, uh, which is what this is saying here, and only when the second ones are equal will this one equal one. And so this is just telling us about the sort of orthogonality uh, of these. Um, and so this one here is telling us that it has to be uh, representations essentially of the of the same well they have to be equivalent representations they have to be the same uh, dimensionality there uh, and so here so this is you know somewhat uh, getting into the the abstract math stuff. So I put this up here with the star telling us that this is the complex conjugate, but more generally, we can uh, say that this is actually this D with this little, uh, this little uh, thing over top of it, which tells us that it is what's called the contra gradient or dual representation, which is the transposed inverse matrix representations of the symmetry operations. Uh, so it's kind of like this: we take the uh, we take the inverse and then we transpose it. And it plays a role similar to the dual space of a vector space. And it has this property, which is pretty much the same as what we had above, where it's just equal to this. And so we can look at it uh, using this. So we have these non-unitary representations of C3V. So these are, this is the representation. Then this is sort of that dual representation here. And so we can see that uh, in this one, for instance, these two negative ones uh, kind of end up over here. And so we are sort of inverting and transposing these things. And if we do this with i equals j equals k equals l. Uh, so I'll erase those. So uh, we are doing like this one times this one plus this one times this one and so on going down the line. We end up with a three here, which is what we found above. Remember, we said that the length of it was the uh, the g over g alpha and so that should be three there and so then though if we have instead i equals k equals l equals one and then j equals two and so now we are sort of multiplying this one times this green one plus this red one times this green one here and so on and so forth we see that that gives us zero which uh, and then if we do the same thing, but we use a sort of two-dimensional and a one-dimensional representation here, we also get zero. And so that is sort of telling us that uh, all of these things are in agreement. So this last one sort of testing the delta alpha beta here. Uh, and then these, this one up here sort of testing the uh, the the delta JL up here. We could do the same thing for the IK here, but we see that only when uh, we have all this here that we get something that is non-zero. Uh, but anyway, you know, this is something that will come up uh, in a later video, this sort of uh, contra gradient or dual representation. And I'll actually kind of go through this a little bit uh, in that video as well, just as kind of a reminder. But uh, I also wanted to state it here just, you know, because it's one of those things that we have to remember. And, you know, like I said, this gets into kind of a lot of abstract territory, which is what we will be focusing on in the next few videos. But anyway, I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next one.